From Glenn and I, a massive thanks for supporting us past 200,000 subscribers. It is literally just us two. There's no company here. There's no behind the scenes cash. And there's no annoying clickbait thumbnails. Hallelujah. So a thanks to any of you that enjoy this content. I'm appreciating RPGs more than I think I ever have. The escapism they offer is unparalleled. And I was excited to see what Atelier Sophie 2 could bring to the table after the excellent Riser 2. Before we begin, let's just get the elephant in the room out of the way, shall we? Some of the characters in this game just have absolutely ridiculous, gigantic pigtails. So there's no accounting for taste. Has it got all the right ingredients? Or is this a failed experiment? Well, let's find out. Narratively speaking, it follows Sophie, who is on a quest to finally be initiated as a fully-fledged alchemist. That's until she gets sucked inside of a giant, mysterious tree that teleports her to another dimension. Sophie, too, has a much more fantastical story. Once inside this new world, she can no longer locate her friend Plakta, I'm probably murdering that pronunciation, who, as you all know, was a mysterious book that got turned into a mannequin, and now... Ugh, she's lost. You'll meet many different characters along the way, each of whom have their own motivations. And as my daughter pointed out, the game features a dragon, instantly making it a classic. Um, yeah. I actually really enjoyed the story. I prefer the more fantastical approaches to JRPGs. Apart from the main storyline, there are missions which relate to each character and which will improve your bond. While potentially not a written masterpiece, Sophie 2's narrative excels at helping the player to escape the realities of life. That Alice in Wonderland style feeling applies to each new area you visit, and these are its strongest moments. Where it slips slightly are in a few two-dimensional side characters. The ditzy sidekick, the arrogant bodyguard, and the moody swordsman still don't manage to capture me in the same way as Cloud and Barra ever did. As far as gameplay and controls go, well, a few things have changed and a few have stayed the same. You control your character using the left stick and camera with the right. You can freely explore several areas and there's an overworld map to allow you to quickly jump between them. Making travel and navigation even easier still are a series of fast travel checkpoints shown with these blue crystals. But as you know, the heart of any Atelier game is the Atelier itself. And this is where we see a few refinements, even on its newest entry. With quick access to the recipe book and a series of prompts guiding you as to how how to unlock the next ones, you'll then approach your atelier. You'll unlock the ability to co-develop items with one of your comrades and have another even boost their efficacy. Alchemical shenanigans take place in the form of this grid. You can sort your items by their quality, their name, or even their attributes, and then you'll be trying to place them Tetris style to come up with the most potent formula. And if you can create links with tiles matching the status effect, this will boost the quality as well as the efficacy of the products you make. It's a system that works well, is very easy to pick up, but also relatively speedy. If it's not quick enough, enough for you, you can always rely on the auto place option, which does a good job of creating quality items, but will never be as good as the player's hands on touch, and that's the way it should be. The Atelier is used for all of your gear and items. If you want to craft a new weapon, then this is how you'll do it. New piece of armor, you guessed it. There are shops in the world, although these are few and far between, and the items you'll find in them are usually much easier crafted. And looking at the world, you start out in the town of Roy Tao. It's a reasonably charming and pleasant place, but as with most JRPGs, it will give you that Westworld vibe when you realize that none of these NPCs actually do anything. Skyrim spoiled me far too early on, and whenever I play these and see characters just wandering endless loops, or even with their arms stuck out at a strange angle for eternity, I can't help but hope that one day these developers go to the effort of creating some life within these areas. Look, it's the way it is in almost every JRPG I know, but there's room for improvement. For the side quest in, you go to the Crystal Sparkle Pavilion, what an amazing name, and from here you'll find standard fetch quests, alchemical quests, and a little bit of banter with a character with possibly the greatest name of all time, Catty uh, Katrina Ballbuster. <laughs> Sorry, am I mispronouncing that? Ballbuster, yeah. I wonder why they called her that. In traditional JRPG style, the combat is turn-based, but it's much faster than almost any other JRPG I've ever played, and that is to its credit. Basic moves and specials are carried out almost instantaneously, and as you unlock the full roster of players, you can then choose whether you want them on the front or the rear lines, with the former carrying out moves and the latter being in support. Each attack will gradually accumulate you TP points. These technical points won't be carried into any of your other battles, so you really need to use them then and there. They allow for the new twin actions, essentially combining forces of two of your team members, but where these 
play a strategic role is in their reduction of your magic cost. The two top skills will usually always require no magic at all, which can be essential if you're running low. There are a few other constraints to this system, such as not being able to use charge skills for the first move, but it's a game changer and again speeds up combat. There's a standard turn order system and the ability to support guard other players to try and mitigate some of their damage, but it's nice to see a few new ideas being thrown in, such as the weather system. During some combat instances, the enemy might be weak to a specific element, say water, or conversely more powerful with it, and by changing the weather using this power, you could draw out their weaknesses. Finally then, some enemies have a powerful aurora around them. This is essentially a shield with a set number of hits required before it drops. Many of the bosses use this, and they're almost invincible until that shield comes down, and then wailing on them will have them finished in a matter of minutes. <laughs> It's nothing particularly new, but it does add a bit of strategy to some of the smaller encounters. If you fall during combat, you can retry the battle or you'll return to your atelier, having lost some of your items and gear. If you've played any of the other 972 atelier games on Switch, then you'll know that much of your time is spent out in the wilderness gathering and collecting items, and nothing's changed there. To aid this, you'll gradually craft a variety of different items, such as pickaxes, scythes, and the trusty bug net. And it's strangely relaxing, dashing around in relative safety hoovering up anything that flashes. There are a couple of mini games tied to this. They generally involve the timing of a button press and don't really add much to the experience, but it keeps it fresh when you find them. I thought that some of the stages were really well designed in their puzzle elements. Now, I mentioned in the combat you could control the weather and that carries over to the main experience. Using the amber dream space stones that you can craft, you'll be able to change the weather at these specific stations, thus bringing out the sun and reducing any waterfall. This world acts as a time loop of sorts. So when it's raining, it's always raining and it always has been raining. Hence, those areas are flooded. When you shift to the sunny, it's always been sunny and as such, you'll find much lower water levels. Leveling up is quite straightforward with points being allocated to your team, but then through your alchemy, you can create quite a few stat boosting unique items and the ability points given to the player each time you level will allow you to craft a build to suit your needs. And it's through applying those ability points that you'll unlock new moves and skills. Atelier Sophie 2 has felt incredibly streamlined and easy to pick up and play. All of the systems make sense. There are handy tutorials at every turn and a guide which makes it so easy to go back and just check if you forget one of the systems. It's a more fantastical and whimsical story that wasn't as emotive or as intriguing as some of its contemporaries, but it's upbeat, entertaining, and just fun to play. If they can start to really think about putting some light life into the towns and cities in these games, they could take the experience to the next level. Gameplay wise, it's certainly the equal of Riser 2 in my opinion. Gameplay scores 18 out of 20. And the controls, which allow you to change the axis and sensitivities, they're not a problem. A minor gripe would be a couple of areas that look like they're accessible, but you can't go there. Controls are fine. They score 18 out of 20. Don't adjust your device because the game really is that colourful. It's eye-poppingly saturated, bright, vibrant, and with an art style that I quite enjoy that almost looks cel-shaded, but it's not. It gives characters a hand-painted aesthetic, and I think it works really well when you've got a device that doesn't have the most power, so opting for a stylistic approach seems to be the order of the day. Character design and the overall architecture of the different areas is quite strong. Level design in particular, using that weather system, has allowed for the developer to create maze-like stages that feel distinctly different when you make the shift. There's also a day-night cycle here, with different times of the day offering different mobs as well as items to be harvested, and at its best, it looks lovely. Something that's great to see is a performance and quality mode. Now, I can't speak for resolution, but I don't think either of them are at native. However, quality mode includes slightly better anti-aliasing, so that's the jaggy edges. Both modes have okay shadows. There's an attempt at reflectivity, but draw distance will suffer in whatever mode you choose. It's not the worst I've ever seen though. In handheld, things are ticking along nicely and both handheld and docked can achieve 30 FPS with some of the heavy areas requiring performance mode if you want to maintain that. The Japanese voice acting seems okay. Not being a native speaker, I can't really speak for the delivery, but what I can speak for is the soundtrack. I absolutely love the instrument, which has become synonymous with Japanese culture and it's used really well in many of the musical pieces here.
Whether it's exploring the world or in combat, the musical design is well thought out and it walks the fine line between catchy without becoming irritating. With OK frame rates, the option for quality or performance, the bright visual style and the varied areas, as well as reasonable text size in handheld, it's a nice package. A few slowdowns in some areas don't detract from that. I give the visuals 17 out of 20. Audio for me is the best in the series. It scores 19 out of 20. We're once again looking at around about a 30 to 50 hour long experience, depending on how slow you are. I tend to always take longer than that though, because I like to do all of the side quests, all of the other content, and then try and find every hidden area. If you're like me, you can expect to spend far, far longer than the stated times. It's a full price Koei Tecmo release, but as far as this series goes, I'm really enjoying the direction they're headed. They're fun and charming games, and with the refinements being put into place here, it's just a pleasure to play. If you're a fan of the genre, or certainly the Atelier games, and no, you don't need to have played Atelier Sophie 1 to enjoy this, there's a whole backstory option where you can watch that. This might be your next JRPG. Most importantly, the game doesn't waste your time. Combat's swift, it's easy to dodge it if you don't want to do it at all, and there's not a great deal of grinding. The new systems are smart, but the story, not quite as good as it could have been. Value scores, 17 out of 20. Sophie 2 is another success in the series, a game that puts a smile on your face from start to finish. While some of the side cast are a touch vacuous, the smart improvements and some of the nice design choices made for a really enjoyable experience. It gets a switch up score of 89%. I think the way the world is at the moment, and certainly our hearts go out to Ukraine, but even the last few years, anything that can offer some escapism seems to hold more value with me. And thanks to our patrons, you guys support us every single month, and remember we do still have 10% discount on all of our eShop vouchers or Xbox cards over at switchup.gg using code SWITCHUP. That goes on until the end of this month. For all things Switch, all the time, keep it SWITCHUP. Cheers, guys. See ya!